Welcome to this presentation about the measurement of attitudes. In almost all studies where attitudes are measured, researchers are using something called a self-report measure of attitudes, meaning that in some way or other, the individual is being asked to verbally report what their attitudes are. Now, this report might be in an interview, maybe a person at a shopping mall is stopped by a researcher who asked them a series of questions, or maybe the person's filling out a questionnaire, uh, either online or on paper. But in some way or other, the person is consciously reporting what their attitudes are. So to start this part of the presentation off, I'm gonna describe uh, different types of self-report measures. The first three that I'm gonna talk about, Thurston scales, Likert scales, and the semantic differential, are general ways of designing a questionnaire to measure attitudes, and they can be used to measure attitudes about just about anything. After I talk about those, I'll describe uh, some different types of attitude measures that exist only to measure attitudes about a specific thing. But let's start with Thurstone scales. Then we'll move to Likert scales, and then we'll go to the semantic differential. These are the three types that are general enough to measure attitudes about anything. And then I will talk about the social distance scale as an example of a self-report measure that can only be used for one purpose. So, Thurstone scales. Bear with me because it takes a little bit of time to explain this. This is one of the earliest types of uh, attitude scales that was developed. You begin by generating a long list of statements about some kind of entity uh, that can be evaluated. So in the example on this screen, there are statements about abortion. Uh, abortion weakens the moral fiber of our society. Adoption is a good alternative to abortion, and so on and so forth. You generate a large number of those statements, and you ask a large group of people to rate how positive or negative that statement is about abortion. Now, at this point, you're not asking the person what his or her attitude is. You're simply asking them to rate, is this a positive or a negative statement about ab abortion? So, um, in the example here, abortion weakens the moral fiber of our society. Regardless of what your attitude about abortion is, you would probably agree that this is an extremely unfavorable statement about abortion. So you would evaluate that statement probably as a one or a two down there on that extremely unfavorable end. And then you would move on to the next statement. Abortion is a good alternative. I'm sorry, adoption is a good alternative to abortion. And you would rate how favorable or unfavorable that is. So you generate a large number of these statements and you have people rate them. And then from that list, you select a, sample of, a sampling of statements that people have some agreement on. So if everybody agrees that it's sort of a neutral statement, you pick that. Uh, if everybody agrees it's a very positive or a very negative statement, you pick those. And each one of these then has an average value ranging from 1 to 11 based on the scores that previous subjects have given to it. All right, so now you're ready to administer your Thurstone scale measure of attitudes. You present the subjects with a list of questions or statements like this. Abortion brings happiness to some, unhappiness to others. And the little 5.1 there indicates that that's the score that that statement would get. Abortion should be encouraged for all unwanted pregnancies. That's a 10.4, so if you check that uh, you agree with that one, you're checking a pretty high value one. So people go down the list just checking the items that they agree with. Now, if they're checking mostly items that are very positive about the uh, issue in question, you're going to end up with a lot of high scores. If you're picking or agreeing with only those items that are very negative, you'll be ending up with lower numbers. So basically you add up uh, the numbers on the questions that the person agreed with, and the higher the score is, the more positive your attitude is. Now, this was a revolutionary thing back in the 1920s when it was first developed, because prior to that time, there was no way to quantify attitudes or compare 
the strength of attitudes between one group of people and another. And this was sort of the first attempt for social scientists to be able to do something like that. Here's a kind of close-up look at what a Thurstone scale would look like if you were filling it out. Achieving success is the only way for my child to repay my efforts as a parent. Agree or disagree. Going to a good college and getting a good job are important but not essential to my child's happiness. Agree or disagree. Thurstone scales aren't as popular as they once were, but you still see them around. Part of the problem with the Thurstone scale is you're asking people to agree or disagree with statements, but you're not really getting an, a measure of the extent to which they agree or disagree. So somebody who really agrees strongly with the statement is lumped in there with somebody who sort of kind of agrees, and you can't really tell the difference between the two. And that's where Likert scales got developed. You've all seen Likert scales. They're probably the most popular uh, or commonly used type of attitude measure. Uh, once again, you're rating your agreement with a statement, but instead of just saying you agree or disagree, you're uh, on a line, usually a five-point scale, but it could be a seven or even a nine-point scale, where you're indicating the extent to which you agree or disagree with something, ranging from strongly agree to strongly disagree. Here's another example of a Likert scale. And yet another example of a Likert scale. So it doesn't always have to be a degree, agree to disagree line, but you're giving the person a, um, a gradation of responses, in this case, from very happy to not at all happy. Here's another style of questionnaire that you've probably seen. It's called a semantic differential. In this case, you're not presented with any statements that you agree or disagree with, but you're given some sort of um, object to evaluate. In this example, it's aspirin. And the brand is for me, they're evaluating their reactions to this brand. And so on the scale of from playful to serious, from wild to smooth, from healthy to sick, from generous to thrifty, and so on down the line, the person circles the number that indicates where along that line they think their feelings lie. Now, you obviously want to use pairs of adjectives. These are called bipolar adjectives. That makes some sense in regard to the uh, thing being evaluated. Here's another way semantic differential, uh, semantic differential scales can be presented. Uh, instead of giving them actual numbers, you just have boxes where they put a check mark in between some point uh, along the line with the bipolar adjectives. Here's another example of a semantic differential scale. All of the scales that I've showed you so far could be used to assess attitudes about just about anything. Aspirin, abortion, dogs, ice cream, presidential candidates, they would work for any of them. Here's an example of a scale that's used to assess only one kind of attitude. It's called the social distance scale, sometimes called the Bogartis scale after the name of the person who uh, first developed this. But this scale is designed specifically to measure prejudice toward a certain group of people. And so the individual is presented with a statement, I would be willing to admit blank. And you fill in the blank with the name of whatever the group is that you're evaluating. I would be willing to admit blank as a class, not the best or worst members I have known, to one or more of the following classifications. And the individual is um, asked to check all of the ones that apply. So uh, if you check, I would admit them to close kinship by marriage. This indicates that you don't feel the need to keep a lot of social distance between you and this category of people, and it would indicate uh, very little prejudice. On the other hand, if you clicked uh, as a close personal friend, but not close kinship by marriage, what you're indicating here is a willingness to be intimately involved with these people, but stopping short of wanting them to be part of your family. 
Uh, on the other hand, neighbors on your street means okay. Um, I'll let these people live where I live, but I'm not going to be friends with them. If the highest thing you check is employment in my occupation, what you're saying is, well, all right, these people are allowed to do what I do, but I don't want them living near me and I'm not going to be friends with them and I certainly don't want them marrying into my family. Citizenship in my country. All right, um, they can be citizens here, but um, they should know their place. They're not going to work with me. They're not going to live near me. And this indicates a fairly stringent negative feeling uh, toward these individuals. Only as visitors to my country, um, they shouldn't be citizens. And the lowest level, of course, would be I would exclude them from my country altogether. So depending on which ones of these the individual is willing to check, you're getting a sense of the level of prejudice they have toward that group of people. And as you can see, this scale is not going to lend itself very well to measuring any other kind of attitudes. Self-report measures of attitudes have certain limitations. And one of the most obvious ones is that the implications of the questions that uh, the individual is being asked are pretty obvious. So if you uh, walk up to somebody uh, at the shopping mall with a clipboard and say you're doing a, a survey of racial attitudes and question number one is, are you a bigot? Well, the person knows what the socially uh, desirable answer is here and you're probably not going to get a genuine response from them because it's so obvious what the question is asking. Another problem with self-report measures is that there are people that are chronic agreeers or chronic disagreeers. They tend to just kind of go down the scales and agree with the statements, uh, even if they contradict each other, or they constantly disagree with the statements. Uh, at any rate, there are lots of reasons why self-report measures are not always as good as we would like them to be. And so social psychologists have regularly experimented with ways of trying to get around them. And let me tell you about some of those. There's something called the bogus pipeline, which right now is just sort of a laboratory curiosity, but I'll describe it anyway as a, uh, an example of how they're trying to get around these problems. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's suppose that when a whole new first year class comes into the college during the orientation period when they're filling out a bazillion surveys and other kinds of paperwork, we slip in a little survey about their personal attitudes about things. What's your favorite flavor of ice cream? Uh, do you like baseball? Um, et cetera, et cetera. Questions about innocuous things that they wouldn't have any reason to lie about. Now let's suppose, uh, oh, near the end of that first academic year, eight or nine months later, uh, the person comes into the laboratory for a psychology experiment. In no way are they connecting this psychology experiment with anything that they did way back in the orientation period when they first came to the college. And we tell them that in this experiment, we're experimenting with a new instrument, which is a very sophisticated lie detector, and that it can catch people when they're telling lies. So what you do is you hook them up to a little device that will send a signal, maybe a, a needle jumps or a buzzer sounds, but in some way or other, it indicates when a person is lying. And so you start asking them some questions and you tell them to intentionally lie to, uh, on the answers to some of them just to see if the thing is working. So you start asking them some of the very questions you already know the answers to. You go back to that survey they filled out at the beginning of the year and ask them, okay, is your favorite flavor of ice cream chocolate? And they say, yes, bah. oh, you caught me, I was lying. Uh, do you like baseball? Uh, no, I don't, but yeah, well, I, you caught me again. So people are bowled over by this. They're really amazed because it uh, catches them every time because the experimenter has an accomplice behind the scenes listening to their answers and seeing if they match up with what they said in the surveys and then just pressing the button to sound the alarm whenever this uh, person gives the uh, wrong answer. Now you've got them. They're convinced that the thing works. They're convinced that it's gonna catch them if they try to lie. And so now you're much more likely to get honest answers out of them because uh, as embarrassing it is to be a bigot, it's even more embarrassing to be caught being a lying bigot. And so if you ask the question, are you a bigot? you're going to get people to agree with you a little better. So uh, 
as you can see, the bogus pipeline is kind of fun and it shows you can get around the problems with self-report, but it isn't very practical for being used in real life attitude measure situations. The implicit association test is another very popular way of getting around the problem with self-report. I'll come back to this one in a moment because I want to spend more time talking about it. So let me just jump ahead for a moment and uh, mention that you can even measure physiological measures um, of, you can use, excuse me, you can even measure attitudes using physiological measures. Uh, so for example, in some advertising research places, uh, they attach electrodes to an individual's face to measure the electrical activity in facial muscles because we found that you get different patterns of facial muscle activity depending upon whether a person is in a happy or an unhappy mood. And so you can gauge an individual's reactions to uh, advertisements that they're looking at based on the electrical activity of their face. So you don't even have to ask the person, do you like this ad or not? You're getting a biological measure of their response to it. So uh, this is another way you might get at some attitudes without having to come right out and ask people. So let me return to the implicit association test, uh, usually known as the IAT. Don't worry too much about remembering all the exact details about how this works. Um, the key thing to remember is that you're using a person's reaction time to a question as the measure of the attitude. And this gets around the problem of being, of people lying to you. And you could also use this to measure stereotypes and prejudices, self-esteem, and all kinds of other attitudes. So basically the person goes through a training period where they get used to pressing a key as quickly as they can um, to give a response to something presented on the screen. So for example, um, career maturity. Is this something you would associate with an elderly person or a young person? And you press one key on the left if it's elderly, another key on the right if it's young. Or you give them a word like happy. Is this a positive word or a negative word? And they respond. Or the word wicked, is it positive or negative? So they go through this training period where they get very used to hitting a key on the left if it's one thing or hitting a key on the right if it's another. Then when you put them in the actual study, they're presented with a, an item like the word English. Is this a Bachelor of Arts or a Bachelor of Science field? But if they've also gotten used to associating something with either being male or female, if you now have Bachelor of Science mixed with female and Bachelor of Arts mixed with male, the reaction time gets slowed down a little bit. Uh, when they, there's an incompatibility. So let's look at another slide here. If you're looking at pictures of faces and trying to classify them as African-American or European-American, if the word good is paired with African-American, a person with a prejudice against black people uh, may have a slower reaction time to that because the inconsistency in their mind between these two numbers slows them down. Uh, so again, don't worry about all of the details about how this works, but just remember that you're using a, how quickly a person responds as a measure of their attitude towards something as being positive or negative. And this gets around the problem of uh, forcing them to say in words what their attitude is. I might also add that on the webpage for this module, there's actually a link to a real study at another university where you can run through an IAT test on your own to really get a feel for how it works. And you would be contributing real data towards studies that are being done using the implicit association test. So uh, you might try that and you'll certainly know a lot more about the IAT after doing that.